So now we get to put Isaiah on the spot here on doing a, a little <laughs> tutorial and, and work through of working with um, objects. You know what? Let's take a step, a quick step back because and it came up when we were talking about calm in general. And the one th and, and it has to do with our course, um, which is what the, the URL above me here would take you to on objects. And I kept telling Isaiah, hey, I in the intermediate auto hockey course, I mentioned using objects and push and, and pull and you know and drop and this stuff, but I didn't do stuff with classes because I don't understand using classes and having examples of classes. So I want to do this. And he's like, but those are just objects. I'm like, yeah, but I want they can be instantiated. Like, yeah. And then he's like, oh, and, and we'll mention calm. I'm like, what? W what does that have to do with that? Yeah, what does that have to do with anything? And it took a while. And I finally, because it's so funny, it's like, I'm not a programmer, right? I came into this from, you know, just uh, uh, to solve problems, but not having a background in it. And the, the calm object for IE was so clear of typing, you know, uh, navigate or close or whatever, right? The methods you'd use, it's so intuitive. And I just loved, it was so easy. And it wasn't until working with Isaiah on our objects course that he was explaining to me that your, your classes are the methods like that you see in the calm object. They're one and the same, and it allows you to use object-oriented programming in your code. And it's just much clearer in understanding what you're doing. And it was just a Holy cow, like once I really got that, I'm like, I, I get it now. Yeah, it's really cool. That is right. So All basically right. <laughs> what wow. happens here, what happens here is that basically um, you should think about uh, come objects, well, sorry, the uh, classes and objects in this type of relationship at like a blueprint and a built house. They are basically the same relationship between them. The class is like a blueprint. You just specify how your object is going to look like. Now, in the same way that you can have blueprints and from one blueprint, you can have many houses, it's the same in this instance when you create a class, you can have many objects that are from that class, are instances of that class. Again, following the analogy, if you have many houses, one house can have, you know, blue color, many windows, no doors. They can be different between houses, right? So they're instantiated from the same blueprint, but they can have differences. Like one of them can have, you know, blue color and stuff like that, right? The same happens with objects. You, you create a class, and when you create an instance of it, you can have different options on that particular instance, and you can create a second instance that has different options than the first one. It's the same concept. So basically, you just have to keep in mind that um, objects and classes do share a relationship of blueprint instance. And COM objects are just interfaces to a class. They are kind of like something that you can interact with that is backed up by a class somewhere that in, in instantiated an object from that class. And again, you just have two objects, the object in AutoHotKey and the object in that on the other language communicating with each other through the COM interface. So COM objects and classes are all related to one another in a special way. And we go about it uh, in the objects class. Right now, what I do want to talk about uh, actually, are very it's a very specific section of the objects that even though we touched about it in, in the course, I do want to kind of like let know people about this one because if you haven't worked with classes and objects, you might not understand, you know, this particular section of them. And I see here the people are actually answering to the poll and we have some people saying that they have never used uh, classes or objects. Some of them have played with it. Uh, some of them have used people, other people's classes and so on. So yeah, we got a good mix. It is mixed, right? So it is about, you know, <laughs> it's a very good uh, mix of, uh, of people here, but mainly they're the most, the majority kind of like use it from the sidelines. They are not into creating their own. They just use some other people code or they don't really go ahead and use it at all. But I want to show you real quick, and I'm going to go ahead and explain uh, real quick what we're looking at 
Um, let me share my screen for a bit. And here we are. So this is basically, uh, I'm, I'm just going to make sure that we can see a class. Now, what I am going to be talking about mainly in this particular presentation are those meta functions and these three up here that do probably something very similar to each other. Now, this section of classes, if you have played with classes, it is a section that might confuse people and it might make them uh, kind of like, what the heck is going on in here? So I'm, I'm gonna try to clarify that real quick. For those who have never played with classes, this is what happens. You, using this particular notation, can create a class with some properties. Like, let's say we were talking about a house a few seconds ago, and the house can have color, and right now it doesn't have any color, and it can have you can do stuff. And one of the things that uh, you can do is open the door. So message box, um, open the door. Basically, you have properties which refer to things that, so th those are things about the object that you can uh, just think about it as adjectives or something like that. Now, here you have actions that the object can perform. And usually they, they are actions that relate to what you're doing. Joe was mentioning, for example, that the, the Internet Explorer had an action called navigate. It grabs the control and navigates to a page. That's what they do. And once you have this, this is the class, right? you can create an instance of that class, which is what we call an object. So now you have my house is my variable and you say new house, and that should give you an instance of that house, of that uh, thing. And now that is an object, which is what we usually use as, you know, dot notation like this. I don't know if that's easy to follow. And basically you can have different houses, your house, again, another house. And one house, for example, my house can have the color equals red and the other house, like your house can be blue. Again, if we think about the, what I mentioned before, this is my blueprint and this is different uses of the blueprint and one of them might be different than the other that's all there is to it classes and objects this is the relationship between them now Isaiah. yes go ahead um can can do you mind if i hop in here and, and throw something out there that that i think um and, and i only learned this in a a c plus plus class right so so why right the, the, the whole question comes up as to why. Why, why is everything? Why would I want to do all that? <laughs> why, why is everything not just an inline script? Okay, and 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 I didn't understand this myself until I, until I took a C plus plus class with a really really super intelligent teacher who dived into compilers with us. Mm. Um, and, and so there's, there's a really short explanation. So you have house, right? Um, I don't want to define another class. I don't want to define another variable that's house dot house color, right? I don't want to have five million variables called house color, right? right. That that are some versions of house color, right? So how do we compartmentalize memory? And, and that is thing. that is that is the essence of the purpose of the evolution into functions, and then eventually into classes. It's just making stuff like part in the memory. <laughs> to compartmentalize memory and keep them isolated from each other. And that was the underlying point to all of it. And, and so the question comes up over and over. Why? Why, why do all of this extra code, seemingly extra code, um, and, and really it has to do with how complex your process is going to be as to whether or not you want to bother with defining all of this but the point of it is to compartmentalize your code, your memory and your operations. Very well. And actually uh, to your point, and I will just go ahead and mention that uh, in general, 
um, if you have a very simple script that reads a file and goes ahead and outputs some information, you very likely will not need to use a class. You will start using classes when you start having programs that do many stuff, uh, many different things at once, and things are going to get very complex. What you want to do is just kind of like group common things together. Anything that has to do with navigation into the website, I'm going to call it browser, right? Browser. And anything that has to do with that, navigate and stuff like that, I'm going to make everything in one place so that it doesn't interact with other things that have to do not with browsers, but actually with my hard drive. So, you know, those are two different things. I don't want to mix the functions from one another. That's basically what you were trying to define. So now, now yeah. that we have kind of like a little basis of what this does and why we would do it, let me go ahead and explain and, and ask you, <laughs> and probably we could just go ahead and type it on the chat. What do, think, do you think it would happen. Now, let me just remove this additional code. So I just created a new house here. What do you think should happen if I refer to a property of my house that doesn't exist? So for example, height. So right now I'm trying to tell to my house to show me its height. I'm just gonna re uh, show a message box that tells me the height of the house. But as you can see here in my blueprint, I haven't actually defined that property. What should happen? Just go ahead and comment in the chat. Just go ahead and tell me, what do you think should happen right here? Or for that, uh, just also, for example, if I want to uh, use a method that doesn't exist, what do you think should happen in this instance? And, and sadly, the answer to this question is not language agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> different languages would do different stuff. And that's where <laughs> that's where it comes. That's That's the problem with it. That's why we go ahead and have these discussions and try to figure it out. And, you know, right? So some people would say an error. Some people say it shows a null, an empty string. So there are different answers to this. The, the height doesn't exist. Actually, this is something some people are expecting. Brian is expecting that the language tells you, hey, that property doesn't exist. You know what that is? That is something that auto hotkey version two would do right away. It would tell you, hey, you're trying to access something that is that doesn't exist. Version one doesn't do that. Some people might say, hey, great. Some others might say, oh, that's a problem. <laughs> if I'm accessing something that doesn't exist, something unexpected can happen. So let's go back to the uh, uh, the code here. What will happen in auto hotkey version one is that you will get blank message boxes, right? But that's where these meta functions come into play. So I'm gonna remove this code right here, and I'm just gonna focus on the meta functions that I showed at the beginning. Uh, let me just go ahead and go back here and just show you. Hey, Isaias. Yes. The other, the whole gotcha that I first had working with classes is unlike functions, it, unless you need you need to make sure you use an include in you know to to pull them in or have it obviously in the same file like you're doing but right. you, know, you can't just throw it in your library and it'll be included like a function does with auto hotkey. that is right if you have a class like this it, it either has to be on your main script or if it is in a different file you have to include it before being able to use it unlike, so, unlike functions in some situations right so so um i i I, I run into that all the time um, just to throw this out there. Um, I generally throw uh, together a function at the top of all of my classes with the exact same name. That's what Maestro, um, yeah. yeah, cool way to- Yeah, where, where it will static instantiate the class so that <laughs> yeah. I can just call it, uh, so that I can just call it as a function. Right. Um, and, and never worry about the include. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now, Here's what these weird functions do. And this is the part that might be interesting to you. 
If you have played with classes, but don't know what these do, or you're confused about it, that's what I'm trying to kind of explain. These things, these two up here, actually get called automatically whenever you create a new instance of the class and whenever you uh, go ahead and remove an instance of the class. So this allows you to kind of like set up or do prep work for your instance if you want. So for example, let's go ahead and take a quick example. For new, and we were actually talking about the house, right? So what I want to do is that whenever you create a new instance, the this keyword, which refers to the object right now, will have a default color, red. That means that whenever I create a new instance, my house equals new house, right? As soon as I do that, without me having to assign any colors, I could refer to my house, uh, sorry, color in a message box. And I should be able to see the color that I assigned here. That's what it should happen. And as if you can see here, I got a message box that says red, even though in my code, I have never assigned a color to it. So basically, the new meta function allows you to define behavior that is automatically done whenever you create a new instance of the object, which is great for certain situations, especially set up whenever you have a lot of variables that need to be set up beforehand or certain things that you want to happen if uh, you're running as compiled or not compiled and stuff like that. You, want, you might want to do that as soon as the instance is created you would do it right here. I think that's very fairly simple to understand. And the same happens when you delete the, um, uh, the object. And by deleting, I just means, uh, for example, doing this. If you are emptying the variable that contains the object, this particular meta function will be called automatically. And it's usually used to um, release pointer references if you have uh, pointer references in your code um, and other type of cleaning up actions. Now, you have to keep in mind, whenever you use the delete function here, global variables are released in arbitrary order. When, so if you are exiting the script, auto hotkey might delete global objects in arbitrary order which means that they could be released before your delete function might have been called. So you might want to try and make sure that you do not access global functions inside your delete function or do not rely on them. Say for example, that there's a global variable named debug mode and you want to have an if debug mode do something, right? What might happen is that you are relying on a global variable outside of your script, but if the script is exiting, that global variable might have been deleted by the system before the delete function is being called, and this line is not reliable at all. That is one of the reasons why we hate <laughs> global functions because it's not reliable in certain situations. This is one of those situations. When you're using the delete function, try to make it self-contained in a sense that it is not accessing outside variables because it might be really unreliable if you're doing that. So I think this use case of creating an object and deleting an object and automatically calling code in each of those two instances is actually something that is desirable in certain situations. And it's actually very good that you can have access to do default stuff. Now for the new keyword here, you can actually, for, for the new function, meta function, you can actually pass parameters to it. You can actually define parameters. So for the color and height, I could, just as a normal function, I can define, define um, optional parameters and actually required parameters. And that means that whenever you're creating a new instance, you can actually pass parameters like this. And the height would be 32 feet, for example. Well, you know, 
uh, yeah, 80 feet or something. Doesn't matter. Now, you can pass parameters when you're instantiating the, 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 the object. And then here, you can use that as variables to your defined you know, thing. So there you go. This is something that you can definitely do. You can pass parameters to a new instantiation. You cannot do that with the delete uh, meta function. Now, I hope that this is actually very clear what it does. Just think about them as functions that get that get called automatically when you're creating or deleting an object. So that's perfectly easy to understand. Now, the same happens down here. These three meta functions do something automatic, but they only do it in a very specific situation. As I was actually explaining a few minutes ago when we were actually uh, uh, having the first example, what happens if I'm calling a method that doesn't exist? So that's what I want to kind of like show now. This particular one gets called whenever you have, you're trying to access uh, a method that hasn't been defined in your class. So as soon as the user or the developer that is using your library or you yourself call a method that is not defined anywhere in your code, like in your class, then the call meta function is called. And it allows you to define some default actions. Um, the first parameter is always passed here. This one is always passed and it contains the name of the meta function that you called that doesn't exist in this instance. So uh, if I go ahead and say return name here, as this is a, a function, I could return values. So I want to show a message box. And what this message box is going to do is grab this name. It's going to pass it as a parameter, uh, as, as an argument here. And I'm just going to return that name back to me. And I'm going to use it in my message box, for example. So now if I run this code, um, I should get nothing, <laughs> of course, because this, uh, let me see what happened there. Let me remove this right here. Oh, so this is not getting cold right now. Oh, because this is not defined optionally. Yeah, there you go. So if the param if the parameter is not defined as optional and you don't pass any parameters, this function doesn't get called. But basically, right now I just made it uh, defined it correctly, and now I could just return the name of the meta function, which is what I was just doing. And again, it's going to grab that. It always contains the name of the function or the, the method that was called. And I could use it as a parameter or, or, or as, a, as an option inside my call function. And I could do deciding statements. If the name is equals to, so let's just go ahead and say, if it is equals to close door, do something, right? I could do something, close the door. But basically I could use that parameter as a deciding factor on whether you're calling a variable that doesn't exist. And in my case, what I usually do, what I use the call meta function for, and actually this here is a, an array of parameters. Whenever you pass one, uh, so let's say one, to what is going to happen is that you would get here an array, I would assume. Let's go ahead and verify that real quick. That shows you that parameter. So it is an array of parameters in case you pass more than one in it. So right now I should be able to, let me see. Let me double check what params is. Um, let me just stop right here. Params has to be defined as veratic. Oh, for it to be a, okay. There you go. All oh, right, there we go. So yeah, I forgot about that one. So now params one must be what I'm expecting it to be, right? So right now I have my 
there you go. So now params one would be the first one. Params two is going to be the second one, which is this one, and so on. So uh, basically, instead of making it optional, what we have to do is mark it as a variadic parameter because it depends how many you pass. It could be many. It could be just one. So in any case, what I usually do with this particular uh, uh, method is that I just define it as if you're calling something that I haven't defined, just throw an error and say, you know, this method hasn't been defined. That's basically what I usually do. That allows me to make sure that my object, whenever you call stuff that doesn't exist, I just tell you, hey, you cannot use that. But in other situations, I might use that to perform very uh, dynamic things. Whenever you call stuff that hasn't been defined, I could actually create some code for that as well. Now, the next two, by the way, do something similar, but they are for uh, when you're trying to access a property instead of a method. So again, this is what I was asking about. So uh, when I made the example of, you know, I want to access the height of the house. Well, in that case, that particular uh, um, property is not set. If I'm trying to get it, like I'm trying to get the value, the meta function that gets called automatically is the get. And this is the one that goes ahead and I could return values. You know, if, so I could say if the key, if key equals height, Then I would return a specific amount, you know, or I could do other code that is more dynamic on that sense. But basically, again, the get meta function allows me to return values that don't exist in my class unless I have defined it directly. So if I have it defined like this, if you do this, it would go ahead and get the one that is defined. This will only get called if what you're trying to get, like heights, doesn't exist. In this case, I haven't defined it in plural. So in that case, it would actually call this meta function. And in that case, I can define what to do in that particular sense. Either throw a message, like this property hasn't been defined, or assigned very quick, <laughs> automated, uh, and dynamic ways of returning values. The other one, which is set, then in this case, it would actually be called whenever you're trying to set a value to a property that doesn't exist in your class. So in this case, I would actually have my key here, my key, then I would say this.key, for example, or I could do it this way, equals whatever value you're passing. The second parameter, or well, depending on how many keys you're passing, the second parameter would be the value that you want to assign to your object or whatever you want to do with it. Because I could use this particular, this one is very useful for me if I'm trying to limit what type of values you can input into my class or my object. So for example, I want to make sure, so if the key is height, Right. If if the key, if key equals heights, for example, I want to make sure that the value is only digits. So regex replace my from my value. So from my value, I want to remove everything that is not a number. That's what I'm going to do right now. So I'm just going to. Go ahead and remove all this and say, remove anything that is not a digit. And I want to remove it from my value and just store that into my key on my object. So again, using the set allows me to target stuff that hasn't been defined 
and going ahead and performing some actions beforehand into the value before I go ahead and save it into my object. So again, this is great for certain dynamic operations that you can do. Um, it can get more complex than this, but I'm just giving you kind of like a very quick overview of what you can do when you're using the new delete called set and get. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna stop right here. Do you have any questions regarding this that I could answer quickly? <laughs> Somebody hates <laughs> one based indexing. <laughs> um, Joe, hold on. Here we go. I'm sorry. Oh. Sorry. I was muted. I was asking a question. Um, did, did you see the question that um, Dimitri had posed a question about why something didn't show up when you had used house? And I read all this earlier, but I was just muted. So yay. Uh, and, uh. and Geek2 had answered him saying it's a quirk with version one. If you don't have enough parameters, um, it doesn't work. But my question to you is, do you know in V2, is that taking care of? Is that of? a thing? Yeah. Well, the thing is that here's what happened. It's not really that V1 is having an issue there. It is something that it is a little bit of a complex topic called um, polymorphism. So what allows me to do, actually, it is a good thing. It allows me to define the same method. Let's say the method is open door with one parameter. So this is which door. And I could define that. And I could also define open door with two parameters, which door and how fast. And I could make totally different actions between the two. And what would happen is that when I actually call my house, right, dot open door, so open door here, like kitchen, is not the same as this other call. What is happening is that AutoHotKey is deciding which of the two functions to call, okay? So it is not an error. It shouldn't throw an error. What happened was I'm not calling the same thing. That's what happened. So uh, here, when I made it like this as a, a, an optional parameter, I passed two parameters to it. And what happened was AutoHotKey didn't call this one because this one is just two parameters. So let me just do this. It would have been like param one and param two. So that was what was going on. I called it with two parameters so AutoHotKey tried to call this method and it didn't find it, so it didn't do anything. And instead, uh, you know, here's the thing. If you call a method that doesn't exist, you should get an error automatically by AutoHotKey. Version one doesn't do that. Version two does. Version two is gonna tell you, hey, you called the, and method that doesn't exist because you call this with two parameters, but you only find the one that has only one parameter. So again, it's not just simply that it should be an error. If I had defined the things correctly, I wouldn't have gotten a blank uh, statement, which is what happened as soon as I made an asterisk here, then I defined it that it could have a variable number of parameters. And that's the reason why the second time actually worked. Um, it's not really that I'm, meritory i'm not obligated to do it this way i just had to define it with two parameters and it would have worked just the same so basically it was more about polymorphism than an error and yeah this would happen on version two as well but in version two as i didn't define the method then it would get an error <laughs>
that's I think what it's going to that it was a uh, method overloading not it's yes a, but still well, it's, it's a way of calling polymorphism it's just that the same function behaves differently depending on how you call it that's what polymorphism really is and yeah it, it will also be called overloading and um, operator overloads is just a way of polymorphism if you think about it polymorphism just means many <laughs> many forms and the same function has different forms depending on how you overload it that's what it's going on um that is a good question so basically um it really depends on whether you want a, the same function to behave differently if you pass one parameter as when you pass two of them and when you want to kind of like really be defining what it can do so as soon as you go out of those two parameters then it just goes ahead and uh throws an error so for example i want my function that if you give me two parameters just add them up but if you give me three parameters i want you to do something else but if you give me four parameters i want it to throw an error in that case is when polymorphism goes in um some people just use uh parameters that are optional and those kind of things so you can have polymorphism just by defining the parameters sometimes defining parameters that you're not going to use is not a good practice and you was you want it to kind of like be differentiated if i just have one parameter i'm going to do one action and it's very clear what it does and i don't have to use if statements because i'm not expecting if statements now, if you have a second one, it just does one action. I don't need if statements. I don't need switch and so on. So some people might prefer just doing this instead, but it's a matter of preference. Uh, yeah, so, so some people uh, prefer just defining different um, uh, methods for it. Now, the second part that I wanted to touch on um, was about what is called inheritance and a lot of people get confused about inheritance so i wanted to kind of like show a very quick example of inheritance and i hope that <laughs> um uh irfan which is the guy who created uh the the rufadium uh uh library doesn't mind that i'm going to use his library as an example of a very clear uh, situation about what inheritance looks like so basically inheritance just means that I can have several classes that relate to one another, right? And when I, uh, this is done for me in order to avoid having to code the same thing over and over again. But, so say for example, I have the class, the class you know, building, house and building, class building extends house this is what the basic inheritance looks like is when one class grabs code from another class and uses it or modifies it and this is interesting for me because say for example that a building is just a big house it's just a house that is uh, it has a few floors you know a house only has one floor or two floors but a building might have 50 floors you know so it's just about but all of them like the house and the building have doors and they all you can open doors and close doors so there's things that are common to both of them and i don't want to be repeating the code whenever i'm doing something that is the same but i do want to specify some things that a building has that a house doesn't so i create a, a, a class that inherits from the house and then just goes ahead and adds um uh, the differences in it now instead of using this kind of abstract thinking let me show you a real life example when would you like to do this and basically um the capabilities class for rufadium gives me a very very good example as to where i might do this in real life this is where what he did he created a class called capabilities with some properties that he can use, like if the incognito mode is on or not, if the headless mode is on or not, you know, here we go <laughs> ahead and see what happens when you create a new instance of the class, which is what we were talking about. He performs some basic setup, okay? And in the setup, he's actually creating the capabilities 
for that object, okay? Now, the capabilities object also has some methods like setting the binary location or resetting the binary. And I know that it doesn't matter if I'm using Chrome, it doesn't matter if I'm using Firefox, it doesn't matter if I'm using Edge, all of them have incognito mode, all of them has headless mode, all of them allow you to use the profile and you can set the binary location for all of them. So this is code that is the same for all of them. And that's the keyword to inheritance. There is code that is shared between many uh, instances of what you're actually working with. But what happens? Chromium, which is based on the capabilities, the main capabilities, actually has certain things that other browsers don't have. And at this point is when you start extending code. So I want to have everything, like I do want to have incognito mode, but I don't have to write incognito mode for Chromium, okay? I already have it. As soon as I extend the main class, I already have that here. I don't have to copy paste the code, okay? I'm just grabbing it from the main one. Now I'm adding stuff that that one doesn't have. The add arguments is not something that everybody can do. Probably Firefox cannot add the arguments in the same way. Maybe you can add arguments, but when I go ahead and define how you do that, probably it's different in the other one, right? So now that I did Chromium capabilities, I know that all of that is shared about uh, 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 <laughs> the same in different browsers like Chrome, Edge, and Opera all are similar because they actually derive from the Chromium capabilities. Now, um, most of them like Edge capabilities, adding ext extensions in Edge is a little bit different than if I add extensions in Opera. You see what I mean? So now each of them actually would behave a little bit differently but they all share the same things that are here, like um, remove arguments um, and the debug port, all of that is shared. Now you notice that the base class, which add extensions here for Chromium has been defined, but then here at the bottom, I'm defining it again. When you do that, you replace the original. So the edge capabilities is gonna replace that method with its own. Now, if it is not defined, it would use the one that was on the main class. That's what is going on. And basically this allows me to kind of like organize my code in a way that I don't have to copy the same code over and over again. And I have fine tuning as to what I'm gonna do in one situation and when what I'm gonna do in a different situation. Right now, this was a kind of like very simple example of how Chrome, Edge, and Opera, all of them relate to the Chromium capabilities, but Firefox is not based on Chromium. So Firefox is actually deriving from the main capabilities as Chrome did. Just look at it as kind of like all of this, is just like a hierarchy. All of them belong or are children of capabilities, all of them belong to it, but Chromium has is deriving directly from it, the same as Firefox, but these three here are deriving from the Chromium capabilities up there. So I hope that this gives you kind of like a basic understanding of what inheritance looks like. Just look at it as a tree view. It's just who belongs, like who's the parent and who's the child. And the only difference is that ch children grab everything from the parent so that you don't have to copy paste, paste your code. You just write it once and now all of them have it. That's all is going on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up uh, for questions. We're gonna have like 15 minutes for questions. And after this, 
we're going to have kind of like a break in which we're going to have some lunch and you know we're going to leave the microphone open so we can actually chat between ourselves if you want or if you want you can talk about whatever you want so um i'm just going to open up for 15 minutes here for questions and then from there we're going to have the break and yeah, is um, also, okay. you mentioned real quickly on you know in an example where you you borrow someone else's code um how by extending it you know you've compartmentalized what your changes are and where their changes are you don't want to talk about that real quick right so basically again say for example that you are using a library that you like very much but you don't like the way how it works and and and, and, and you can even do this with auto hotkeys own classes like for example the well in version two for example that we're using a class for the GUIs you can say very easily class my GUI extends GUI and now you have all the code so your class will behave almost the same as the GUIs that are defined in version two but now you can add or remove stuff that you don't like so now you can go ahead and say you know I don't like how the GUIs work with um, uh, with adding objects. So you can go ahead and modify the add method to work however you want it to work instead of the other way because you don't like it. And this could happen with any class. If in the forums you download a library that is itself a class, you just uh, my this view class, for example. I think there's a class, a list view class out there you can actually, my list view, you can definitely just grab that class, extend it. And basically when you're extended, you're not only copying it and you can modify it, but you can replace stuff. You, you cannot only append new things to the class. You can also totally replace something that it does for a way that you like better. So let's say, you know, like you said, you borrow someone's thing, you don't like either you don't like something or you want to add to it. Let's say this wasn't the way you did it. You took their code, you copied it, you rewrote big sections of it with your code. And then they go and make a big update, right? Like now oh, yeah. you got to go back and look at the original code and see how yours integrates with it, right? This negates that whole issue, right? You go get their new code and just still use your but you right? still use your thing so long as you're not because you're always replacing what they did say that they have this list view class that has the add function you don't like it they make a modification to the you replaced it right now you just replaced it if they make an update and you download the new thing as soon as you instantiate your class it's going to be replaced anyways so you don't care about the changes anymore so again this allows you to do stuff in a different in your way especially for example you mentioned that you loved the way that the internet explorer control had this navigate function right and that it was very intuitive for you to just navigate there are some classes that don't have the navigate function let's say that it says go to <laughs> so let's say this is a, a browser a custom browser custom browser that has this weird thing that for going to a page it says go to and then you have to specify the page and you don't like that. You really don't like that. You want to use the navigate. Well, you just grab and say my browser, extend it, and then just say that navigate just simply calls custom browser go to. Um, so let's just do this, go to URL and the navigate takes one parameter. So this is this is basically something that you can do. You don't like the name of the function that they used? Well, you can create your own name and now whenever you have your browser, you can just say my browser navigate, which is what you're actually used to and just pass the URL to it. And in the code, it will do the call the correct call in this instance to whatever you whatever the class actually had so you're adding syntax sugar to it you just make it behave how you want and extending classes is a very easy way to do that 
and a way that is non-destructive. You don't have to modify the original code at all. You just extend it to whatever you want to do and replace whatever you want. Someone earlier asked about, so how does this relate to Calm? And I was just saying like, you know, you're using the object-oriented programming when you're using this kind of an approach, which it's in Calm, it's just what's, you don't, it's, it's what's behind the curtains, right? You can't see it, but you know it has these methods that you're using or properties that you can access. Yeah. Um, to answer Dimitri's question, uh, you know what? That is one of the artifacts of thinking in version two. What I was trying to refer to was a static method, you know, and using a static method, you would have to call it like I just did. But in Auto Hotkey version one, you don't have that. So yeah, you could use this or you can use my browser or you can call that class directly. Either of the three approaches is correct in version one. It's the same thing. In version two, it depends. If the method is static, you would have to call the static name, which is like this. If it is not static, you would have to call this, which is a little bit different. I think we talked about it, Joe, in one of the videos that we did um, that I quickly made the dif distinction between a static method or uh, you know, uh, an instance method. Uh, but basically, <laughs> my mind is always thinking in B2 right now, and I did that you know, like intuitively. That's what happens. So basically, yeah. I hope that this explanation was clear. As, uh, somebody said, you yeah, know, thank you for the explanation. I hope that this kind of like opens up a little bit more the world of objects into a little bit more usable because it, there is a lot of situations which using classes and objects and extending classes makes more sense. Actually, again, this to me, as soon as I saw the code, I know what was going on and it makes sense because Chrome, Edge, and Opera all are from the Chromium thing and Firefox is not. But Chromium and Firefox, which are type of browsers, have similar capabilities. They both have some things that you can do in both of them. So this makes sense in a coding kind of way, and it allows you to separate stuff so that if I need to fix something for Edge, I don't have to scroll through all the code. I just go to Edge here and modify the information for Edge only and fix my stuff just for Edge. So this is something that, um, again, getting used to objects and object-oriented notation is very good um, for us to get kind of like <laughs> used to it. Yeah, I'm muted. Oh, I, um, thanks. That's awesome. I said it earlier, and and I know this isn't. There is no quote unquote definition of a programmer, right? Uh, but when you start using classes, the, one of the big reasons why is you're doing more, you know, more advanced stuff, but also you're building code in a much smarter, organized way that's maintainable, and in like I said, you can extend it. It's it's the second you start using that. To me, that's when I if I, I do start really using classes and writing them, I'd say, okay, I am a programmer. Someone made a comment earlier Will I ever admit to that. I'm like, you know, I, I, I still, <laughs> now that I went through the course, I learned a ton um, and I get it a lot more, but um, until I actually start writing them, you know, I'm, I'm still not. <laughs> yeah, you're not gonna. Now, somebody, uh, Mage Prometheus, actually very interesting nickname, um, is asking something a little bit more advanced. And just to answer your question there very quickly, um, it does not support it directly, but that's why you have DLL calls. So DLL calls allow you to do that because actually the DLL calls are strongly typed and you have to specify the type that you're passing through it. It's not exactly the same. <laughs> and the last statement that you had there that says that classes are more convenience than a full implementation, that is correct. It is just sugar sy syntactic sugar but I could definitely convert a class to actually go ahead and perform DLL calls, which is strongly typed into whatever object I'm actually trying to connect to, but not for auto hotkey itself. Like inside of auto hotkey itself, I cannot definitely not use uh, V tables uh, for an auto hotkey uh, class. 
I can use V tables for libraries. Like for example, I had a, 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 an instance of the uh, Scintilla control and I'm using a technique similar to the V table being used there. And the UI automation library that is out there uses V tables for calling each of the methods. But again, it is a class, but each of the methods is calling a DLL, is making a DLL call. And that DLL call is using a, a V table for it. So you will get the same speed and reliability um, um, uh, advantages that you would get. The only thing is that it's not for the for the class itself. You're welcome. Uh, Geek Dude was clarifying about V1 um, and about you know the difference between calling an, a, an instance method and a static method. The only thing is that in V1 you do not necessarily uh, specify that it's a static method in the class itself. That is a video, that, that's something that I will explain in a different video. And actually we talked about it a little bit in one of the videos here with Joe. That is right. Does anyone else have any other questions? We're almost done with this part. We'll grab some lunch. Everyone answered the door, we've sent lunch to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, some people just, just went ahead, you know, like they, they started already. Let's go. So that's good. You can go ahead and, and um and have what we're gonna do. I don't know, Joe, if you want to do that, is just to open the microphone and you know everybody can chime in with their thoughts or um or just raise your hand and I'll meet you and directly just in and, and I think you all know I, I'm it's I'm never <laughs> one to just say I want to be the one that talks because it's not it. It's when I've had meetings where there's you know 40 something people on here someone invariably thinks well I'm, I'm gonna unmute myself and i'm gonna sit here and then they forget it's unmuted and it goes <laughs> oh, yeah it's true. that's the old honestly one reason why yeah, I, yeah. Um, it's true, I don't allow it. but with this many people it's it's mayhem it's, so if right. you raise your hand which in zoom you can raise your hand and i can you know set you to unmute or one of the or isaiah's can and i saw thomas yeah. here i see somebody saying like it, it would be nice to have lunch but it's 1 a.m in singapore <laughs> So yeah, well, it's not going to be lunch. Indeed, you, you are really interested to go ahead and join the meeting at 1 a.m. Yeah. over there, you know, like. So let me go ahead. I'm going to stop the recording just so we tighten that back up with the um the object lecture. Thanks again, Isaiah, for leaving that. And I don't have the URL, but um, you know, he put together our objects course, which it's really much more about, you know, objects, classes, object-oriented programming than it is. People are like, oh, I use objects. I'm like, yeah, that's what I thought too. Yeah. So, you know, we worked through this. And I'm like, okay, I get it. <laughs>